Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Special Collections Summer Seminar Series. I'm Elizabeth Reardon, Outreach and Engagement Librarian for the University of Iowa's uh, Library Special Collections. Today, I'll be talking about prohibition, specifically prohibition efforts in Iowa, as well as collections you can use in Special Collections to help you wet your whistle on this topic. In January of 1919, the 18th Amendment was ratified giving Americans just one year to stop the manufacture, sale, and importation of intoxicating liquors. By January 1920, the 18th Amendment was fully in effect and the United States was proclaimed dry. Efforts by prohibitionists started in the 19th century with women entering saloons, falling to their knees and praying, or others like Carrie Nation storming into a saloon with a battle ax. Prohibition drew unlikely allies like Billy Sunday, Jane Addams, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, Industrial Workers of the World, and the Ku Klux Klan. As Daniel Okrent writes in his book, Last Call, The Rise and Fall of Prohibition, there were five distinct components that made up the Prohibition Coalition. Racists, progressives, suffragists, populists, and nativists. Okrent writes that adherents of each group may have, opposed, may have been opposed to alcohol for its own sake, but each used the prohibition impulse to advance ideologies and causes that had little to do with it. Prohibition invited corruption and bribery on both sides. It also took away millions of dollars of tax revenue for the US government, not to mention the people who died from organized crime or unsafe homemade liquors. So it was a failure on a lot of levels, but it did succeed on one important aspect. Americans drink less. According to Okren's book, at the beginning of the 20th century, the average consumption of pure alcohol ran 2.6 gallons per adult per year. And that number went down during prohibition and even lasted after the repeal of 1933. We actually don't see those numbers again until the 1970s. But I wanna focus on Iowa. Prohibition efforts here in Iowa started earlier, much earlier than the 20th century across the United States. In fact, for Iowa, temperance organizations were already working to make Iowa a dry state that is alcohol free right after it was ratified in 1846. This list that you see here of actions are just some of the efforts made to make Iowa dry. It isn't a full comprehensive list because frankly, we don't have time to talk about it all. <laughs> in fact, historians often put Iowa, Kansas and Maine together as the three states with the strictest alcohol laws during this time. And I'll be honest with you, that surprised me. I assumed we would have been a wet state given the fact that a majority of Iowa's population at this time were German immigrants or the descendants of German immigrants, a group often associated with the support of beer manufacturing. Um, but I'll get to that a little bit later. Again, Iowa became a state in 1846 and by 1847, a local option law passed making it so that every county had to decide if it pr would provide licenses or not to sell alcohol. In the election, all counties except for Kiaka no these licenses. And this was a big win for temperance groups. Liquor dealers had to close up shop. However, they found ways to secretly carry on with their business and eventually some of them openly started selling liquor again. So this first attempt was a failure. But in the next couple of years, measures were taken to fix that failure, including a ban of dram shops or more commonly known as bars in 1851. It was illegal to sell liquor by the glass, but not illegal to make it or sell it as merchandise. So you can kind of see where this is going. Bars sold alcohol as merchandise and nothing much really changed. 1855 came along and there was another big push to regulate liquor licenses. This, bans alcohol, this would ban alcohol in the state, but it was later amended to say that beer, apple cider, and wine were okay to drink. But Again, it's not really enforced. So people continue to illegally sell liquor and to consume it in the state. So by 1882, legislators added the amendment to the state constitution, making it illegal to manufacture and sell all alcoholic beverages statewide, thus making Iowa dry. However, the Supreme Court came back quickly the following year and declared that unconstitutional. That didn't stop the prohibition movement though. In 1884, another strict prohibition law on liquor license passes, and this one actually stays in effect until 1893. However, like previous attempts, it wasn't really followed in some communities. 
And this is what really sets the stage for Iowa City beer riots that happened in August of 1884. So a quick story time for those of you unfamiliar with the beer riots. Iowa City at the time had three big breweries that were just located north of downtown. The brewery owners were wealthy, powerful, and they were the largest employers in Iowa City downtown. Two of the brewers, Conrad Graff and John P. Dostal, were to stand trial for violating the alcohol law that had passed earlier that year. The third brewer, John Angler, yes, as an Angler leader, along with 150 brewer supporters, came to the judge's house where the trial was to take place, and it quickly became a mob. They attacked the witnesses for the prosecution, even threatening to hang them right then and there. They got a hold of one of the prosecutors, William H. Bailey, and tarred him. I don't know who brought tar with them, but he was tarred. And when an officer tried to break it up, he was stabbed in the leg. So the mob even got more frenzied at this point and decided to burn down the judge's house. And the only thing that stopped them was the fact that the judge's dying mother was lying upstairs. And I think if she hadn't been there, they would have burned down his house. The riots received national attention and some folks even thought that the State University of Iowa, as UIOA was called then, should be moved to a less lawless area. Despite all these issues though, and these previous efforts, there was still a strong enough support that in 1916, a strong statewide prohibition law passed three years before the rest of the country. Now, I have to stop and talk about this picture for just a second. It's a float from the 1916 Mecca Day Parade at UIowa. And I like this image a lot because you're gonna see there's an advertisement for Graff Brothers, which was uh, Conrad Graff who stood trial 30 years before this was taken, or a little over 30 years. Now, despite so much support of prohibition, the major issue of enforcement had not really been fixed. And the history of Iowa's efforts to become a dry state should have been an indicator of how the 18th Amendment was gonna go. Instead of crime and violence disappearing after prohibition, it increased in Iowa and the nation in the 1920s. However, not as dramatically as the news made it out to be. Yes, there was money to be had in selling illegal alcohol, but there was also a lot of money to be had in selling newspapers that featured these scandalous stories. So bootleggers, those that made and or sold alcohol illegally, could make good money in Iowa. And if you think about it, Iowa is actually a really great place to set up an alcohol running operation. For one, we're surrounded by the key ingredient. Iowa corn turned quickly into some of the best prohibition whiskey out there. Many of us from Iowa are familiar with Templeton Rye, the reddish whiskey that was very popular in Chicago and even New York speakeasies. Also, rural Iowa was a great place to hide your distillery, since you're less likely to be bothered by law officials when out in the middle of nowhere. Folks like this gentleman, Carl Quad, better known as Curly, also known as my great grandpa, he and his brothers hid their operation behind a false wall in a corn crib. We know this because, well, <clears throat> they were actually caught and it was in the paper. So I'm not saying that there wasn't any enforcement happening. You also hear of bootleggers in Iowa using caves, hog houses, barns, and basements. And while many bootleggers didn't document their actions for obvious reasons, my family lore informs me that Curly here used the radiator in his car to transport his product from place to place. Things were getting so out of control in Iowa that some law officials worried that Al Capone would make Des Moines a little Chicago. Iowans came to realize their dry utopia wasn't gonna happen and many began to see prohibition as a threat to their safety instead of something to enforce safety. The experiment had failed, and while there was still a strong group who supported prohibition, much of the state would strongly support repeal in 1933. So that's just a quick overview of prohibition in Iowa. And prohibition and temperance permeates a lot of the collections found in special collections in the archives. And I just wanna give you a small sampling of them uh, today that we have that you can look at. So we're gonna start here, and I'm gonna fix this real quick, that's better. So the Women's Christian Temperance Union of Iowa City, um, or of Iowa collection can be found in the Iowa Women's Archives. And it's a huge collection, but also really important for this topic. And because this group is so prominent and important to the prohibition movement, I just wanna give a quick background of them. This group, which is still around today, is considered one of the first organizations of women 
devoted to social reform. They really started with temperance as their main goal, as their main goal. But when the second president of the WCTU, Frances Willard, took over the group, she brought with her the slogan, do everything. And the group became heavily involved in other reform issues that came out at this time. This included women's suffrage, which was closely linked to movements of prohibition, prison reform, free kindergarten, and more. The group was officially declared um, at the National Convention in Cleveland, Ohio in 1874, with the first national WCTU president being Annie Whitmer, who you see pictured here, who was actually from Keokuk, Iowa. And I think the fact that there was an Iowan leading the charge on the national stage, uh, that kind of helped Iowa be right there with her because Iowa's first state convention uh, for the WCTU was held in 1874 as well in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Under Ida B. Y. Smith, the WCTU of Iowa joined other state with temperance groups to lobby successfully for the reinstatement of prohibition in Iowa in 1960. Because remember, in 1882, we had passed this. Y. Smith goes on to serve as the national president of the WCTU. And uh, under her, there was the repeal. She, uh, she took over in 1933, which saw the repeal of the 18th Amendment. And she led the group during that time. So this collection is huge because it spans over 100 years of history, right? And there are meeting notes and other things that are digitized and can be found on the Iowa Digital Library. Uh, there are writings in favor of amendment against liquor that date back from the 1800s. Uh, this one pictured in the middle here is from 1876. Uh, as long as with efforts for women's suffrage, um, there are scrapbooks filled end to end with newspaper clippings about alcohol in the state as well as WCTU's efforts for reform. There's also albums with local members and prominent national members' photographs. If you are interested in prohibition in Iowa, this is a must-see collection. We also have the Iowa Authors Collection. And as you can probably tell, this collection is all uh, books written by Iowans. Uh, and within this group, there's a lot of authors that were big movers and shakers within the temperance movement here in Iowa, including, again, Annie Whitmer, Whitmire, who you see here in her book, History of the Women's Temperance Crusade. What makes this edition really interesting is that there's actually an introduction from Frances Willard, that second president who brought her slogan, do everything and really changed the organization. We also have works by Billy Sunday, including sermons and his book, Get on the Water Wagon. Now, I could have done a whole speech just about Billy Sunday. Um, he was born in Story County, Iowa, and grew up in extreme poverty, but he managed to leave Iowa and join Major League Baseballs in Chicago and, and Philadelphia, um, but he left the game to join the ministry. And he was extremely successful as a preacher at the time, one of the most successful preachers of his era, actually, gaining a huge following, especially here in the Midwest. Some stats show that he preached to maybe 100 million people during his 40 years at the pulpit. He was known as the fighting pastor. And a lot of the images that you see of Billy show him as in this aggressive stance like you see here on, the, on this uh, screen. He really created this ferocious attack on alcohol, saying it was God's worst enemy and hell's best friend. And his speeches were full of fire and brimstone, but boy, could he get an audience going. And because of this, um, he had a large hand in Iowa going dry in 18, uh, 1916 as well as playing a role in getting the 18th Amendment passed. The final collection I'm gonna talk about today is Zach Mary Culinary Collection. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, this collection comes from Louis Zach Mary, who was a famous chef. He owned the bakery in Chicago. Zach Mary was also a huge bibliophile. When he died, U Iowa received around 18,000 of his books, manuscripts, and pamphlets uh, that have to do with food and drink. And so this collection includes several books of temperance and prohibition, as well as several cocktail books written and printed during prohibition. And so what makes a lot of these books interesting to me is that they reveal about reveal the different tactics used by those in favor of prohibition. The books shown here rely heavily on the emotional impulses, showing the destruction of the nuclear family caused by alcohol. Curse of the Drink here depicts a mother wondering which bar her son is drunk at tonight on the cover. And when you open it up, there's a poem that goes along with it that pulls up the heartstrings, right? And you see very similar um, images in the liquor problem 
which show a happy, healthy family with prohibition and a sad, hungry, destitute family when the bars are open. Um, and you can kind of tell in this image that the city behind them with the bars open is literally on fire. Several of these books reveal the more nefarious and racist tactics in the name of prohibition. I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that the KKK were invested in the temperance movements. Racists used prohibition as a platform for white supremacy, utilizing images of the drunk African American or Catholic to scare the white Protestant reader into seeing drink as a danger to them, even if they were not the ones partaking in the drink. And I want to give a content warning for some racist and biased rhetoric uh, found in some of this material that I'll be talking about. One book titled Alcohol, Hygiene, and Legislation by Edward Huntington Williams states that all human beings have instinctive cravings for such substances as alcohol, tea, coffee, tobacco, or narcotic drugs. But he goes on, since the vast majority of the persons do not crave excessive quantities, but simply enough to maintain mental equilibrium, we must consider this type as normal and stamp as abnormal the person who indulges habitually in excessive quantities. As you continue reading though, you realize that abnormal is code for foreign or not white. He manages to say that the increase in urban populations and city living have caused a rise in alcoholism and then makes the leap to say that communities that sell alcohol have a bigger issue with cocaine, stating that black citizens must have one or the other and that just one dose of cocaine sends them into a homicidal frenzy responsible for most of the wholesale killings that have occurred in the South in recent years. This book came out in 1915, the same exact year as The Birth of a Nation, E.W. Griffith's famous film that romanticizes antebellum South and depicts African Americans as unintelligent sexual deviants. This film and books with racist rhetoric like this one helped revive the KKK, including here in Iowa, who, just in case you forgot, was part of the Union. The KKK extended past the South and into the Midwest and the West in the 1920s attracting white Protestants who supported the Klan's message of clean living and to attack dope, bootlegging, nightclubs, sex, and other scandalous behavior. And these tactics weren't going unseen at the time. In another book from 1928 found in this collection, The Case of Whiskey by George Howell, the author points out to, that groups like the Anti-Saloon League were using the Klan to get support from Southern states for their own ends. He condemns these actions and the rise of such menacing groups in America and ends this chapter with this note. Our gravest danger today is that the large majority of our voters, occupied with minding each his own business, shall, by this laissez-faire attitude toward public issues, give over the reins of our government to the clamorous minority of fanatics who have organized to mind the other man's business. A Case for Whiskey is rare because it's one of the few books in the collection supporting alcohol at this time. While there are a lot of temperance writings in this collection, there is a genre of book in this collection that challenges these dry writings. And that is a cocktail book that was published during the Prohibition era. To me, this feels like, like a cheeky move that authors used and um, like thumbing their nose at Prohibition, if you will. I can't make these drinks anymore, but I'll certainly write about them. Some of these books talk about drinks from fam famous uh, establishments in New York clubs. Some contain favorite drinks of celebrities and some include rather curious and questionable histories about certain cocktails. One of my favorites is the Bon Vivant Companion from 1933, which was privately published by George Zabrinsky, who was a prominent member of the New York Historical Society. It was a Christmas gift for his friends that year. What makes this one so interesting though is the last line of his introduction. Howsoever, here's to you. The 18th Amendment will soon be a dream. Drink hearty and best wishes for a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. But my real favorite, and it's strictly for the title, is Giggle Water from 1928. This book actually has a section on homemade gin and how you can make gin to taste like some of your favorites from days of yore. To me, these cocktail books seem gutsy and brazen, a form of resistance in their own way. This was just a sampling of the material in our collection. There is so much more to be had. I didn't even get to Mayor Emma, Emma Havertz, uh, Hav Haravitz, sorry, collection in IWA, the mayor of Iowa City who fought against the flapper movement and bootleggers. I didn't get to judge 
uh, William Kenyon's papers or John Calhoun, who both uh, were against repeal in 1933. But I hope what I did show you, you enjoyed. And I hope that you also take away that prohibition is a large and complicated topic, more than just drinking and not drinking. It reaches deep into several underlying issues and still impact that still impact this country. And if you want to know more about this topic, Special Collections is happy to help you explore these and other collections more deeply. But also be sure to check out some great re online resources put out there by the State Historical Society of Iowa and Iowa PBS on this subject, which I'll be sure to link to in the description when we get this on YouTube. So thank you and cheers. <laughs>